Welcome to First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis, the birthplace of Congregational Humanism. We carry on that tradition of free thought today, dedicated to promoting a free search for truth, meaning, and justice. Our web address is firstunitarian.org. I'm David Breeden, Senior Minister. Welcome. Good morning. I'm Allison Wyeth, Director of Religious Education here at First Unitarian Society. And I want to welcome everyone, including kids, youth, and families, to our assembly this morning. Often at this time, we ask our youth to gather around to hear a story that connects them to the ideas that we'll be sharing. Today will be a bit different. A little later on, we'll hear a talk about how our community is being challenged to stay engaged with one another, even as we're required to be physically distant and why that matters. With that in mind, today we'll share an inventive way that our youth came up with to stay connected that they can contribute to the rest of our community. I present to you the FUS stuffed animal sleepover. Exactly because we can't be together physically in the building right now, uh, last weekend youth were invited to drop off their favorite stuffy to join in this event. Let's see how it went. Monkey and I got there early to make sure everyone knew they were in the right place. We made sure everyone could stay safe during drop off and we welcomed each new friend as they joined the group. This little fellow showed up too. I don't think he read the invitation completely. He wished us a good evening and decided to head out. Once everyone had arrived, Monkey and I helped everyone get cleaned up so we didn't share any germs. We started our time together by lighting a chalice. Bobby got to handle the fire because he was the most experienced He's about to turn 47. Then we spent some time getting to know each other over ball games and coloring. Some of us colored very carefully. And others decided to express ourselves a little more freely. We played card games, other games, and did a puzzle together. Hey, monkey. Puzzle pieces are not for snack. Speaking of snack, since everyone was getting a little hungry, we decided to make a snack to share. Then we watched a TV program together. We all voted and Scooby-Doo won. As the evening was winding down, we read some of our favorite books to one another. Finally, we went for one last drink before bed. In the morning, we went to assembly. Monkey shared some opening words. And we all sang one of our favorites, Blue Boat Home. So there you have it. Our youth, once again, showing us the way, showing how to connect with one another in new and different ways. We hope you too are able to find yourself living into this new world and finding fun and inventive ways to stay connected with your beloved community here at FUS. Thanks a lot, Allison and Monkey. Welcome to our online assembly for First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis. I'm David Breen, I'm the senior minister, and with me today is Allison Wyeth, our director of religious education. Also, Barb Brooks, our director of music with a couple of wonderful piano songs and a couple of friends of FUS, Peter Mayer and Anthony Cruz. First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis is a member congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations, and we are the birthplace of congregational humanism. We continue to be an intentionally and radically inclusive congregational community dedicating to promoting a brave and free search for purpose and meaning and justice. Our theme for the summer of 2020 is Season of Change, and today I want to consider how gatherings of free thinkers may look in the future. 
Yeah, our building is closed for the foreseeable future, but our hearts remain open and we are meeting online. Please be sure to read the Friday email each week to keep up with what's happening at FUS. Yeah, it's a little harder these days, but we are staying in touch by electronic means. If you're not on our email list, you can sign up. Go to firstunitarian.org, look at the bottom of the page, and sign up for our Friday email and some other emails as well. Thank you very much for joining us today. This year's State Fair is canceled. That's why we're offering Deep Fried Talent on a Stick, a State Fair themed talent show starring the people of FUS. Have you decided what you're going to perform? So far, we've got a clarinet, a harp, and at least two fiddles. We've got poetry, song, and even a dance number. In between performances, you'll see photos of arts and crafts, culinary feats, and agricultural accomplishments. And everybody gets a blue ribbon. Join us for Deep Fried Talent, Saturday, August 29th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. on Zoom. Email Reverend Jim to register and learn more, and we'll see you at the get-together. One of the things we hear a lot from you is, hey, I want to see more FUS faces on assembly on Sundays. And we'd love to do that. And one of the easiest ways to do that is for you to record a chalice lighting with either just your hands or with your face, which we would, of course, prefer. Now, you can do this even by yourself. I have a smartphone, I have an iPhone, so I go into the camera and I put it on video and I put it on selfie so that I'm taking a picture of myself. Now, here's my candle. Got the trusty barbecue lighter here. And so I'm going to record myself lighting the chalice. And then I'm gonna wait for a few moments and I can either stop the video and uh, have two files or I can just wait a little bit and blow it out. So either way, one or two files, we will have you lighting and extinguishing the chalice. It's really quite easy. And after you get it done, uh, send it to me. It's a small file. Uh, send it to me at minister at firstunitarian.org. And we would be so happy to uh, get you lighting the chalice on our assembly. Thanks. Each week when we gather, we light our chalice and share one of the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism, or one of the aspirations of our congregation. This week we light the chalice remembering our aspiration to support one another's journey toward meeting and connection in the here and now. Now for our Congregational Covenant. Love is the spirit of this place, and service its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Wise Ben, Franklin,
kind-hearted hero fights for justice for all where have you gone I've been searching a chance, land a welcome, brave and free, come back to me, America. Each week when we gather, whether in person or online, we take a few minutes to reflect on the joys, sorrows, and milestones of the human experience. We do this so that we stay in touch with our own humanity. We do this to remind ourselves of the value of a moment of stillness. And we do this so that no one among us is alone, either in celebrating joy or in facing the burdens of life. This morning we pause to acknowledge the deep grief that can come with living in a time of tremendous loss and uncertainty loss of human connection and gathering, loss of income or shelter or health, loss of loved ones and the opportunity to grieve and remember them in the embrace of community. Many of us are living with a complicated grief, a grief mixed with anger over the human choices that have brought us to this point. And there's a level of uncertainty that can make daily life seem like a tunnel with little to no sign of light at the end. As we acknowledge the grave difficulties and hard decisions of these times, may we think of all of those who are working toward creating the beloved community, those dedicating their lives to compassion, service, and justice. And may we remember that just as human beings had the power to create today's problems, so too do we humans have the power to bring about a better world and better days. We will now enter into a moment of silent reflection. As we come out of the silence, we'll hear our traditional musical response. You are invited to sing along at home if you wish. The 20th century Czech social scientist Carl Deutsch defined a nation as a group of people united by a mistaken view of the past and a hatred of their neighbors. Or sometimes it's translated as a nation is a group of persons united by a common error about their ancestry and a common dislike of their neighbors. Either way, that's a little bit cynical, yes, but I think Deutsch is getting at that idea about how human groups form. We draw a circle, 
that creates an us and a them. Now, generally speaking, any group uh, is at least partially othering others, drawing that circle that makes an us and a them. At one end of the spectrum, the circle drawing can be mostly about clarifying our values. Uh, that's uh, why we have the seven uh, principles of Unitarian Universalism. It's why we have the aspirations of First Unitarian Society. Uh, we put those on our website. We repeat them on Sundays. These are ways of saying this we believe. We hold these truths to be self-evident. It's a clarification of values. That's the positive side of the spectrum. Carl Deutsch uh, is talking about the negative end of the spectrum, a jingoistic nationalism that would justify mass detentions at borders and the incarceration and deportation of vulnerable people. Group identity run amok, if you will. Now, today, I want to hold that idea in tension with another idea, and that is uh, how the heck do we continue doing church during a pandemic? Now, I'm not talking about the nuts and bolts here of keeping the building open or developing a task force on building reopening. I'm not talking about the issue of how to conduct business meetings by Zoom, although, of course, all that is important. What I want to talk about is the larger issue of how to fulfill the mission of First Unitarian Society during this time. You know our mission. First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis is a congregational humanist community dedicated to promoting a free search for truth, meaning, and justice. That's our mission. How do we do the congregational and the community part of that mission? And how do we promote that free search for truth and meaning and justice during this time? Because that's what we're called to do, isn't it? To create com a community promoting a free search for truth, meaning, and justice, even in times of pandemic. Now, while we were talking the other day, Rev Kelly happened to use an old cliche phrase, uh, plowing new ground. Now, I'm unsure what it means to most people who use the, that phrase, plowing new ground, but I've plowed new ground and it's not easy, uh, which is to say, yes, in this COVID-19 pandemic, we're all plowing new ground. Now, to start, you have to realize that new ground has a very specific meaning to farmers. Plowing new ground isn't about merely plowing in a field that you haven't plowed in before. New ground is land that has recently been cleared of trees. It's ground that's sometimes never been plowed before or hasn't been plowed for a very long time. Now, where I come from, the southern part of the state of Illinois, the default condition of land around there is hardwood forest. The British writer Charles Dickens, when he visited that area in the mid-19th century, said that a squirrel could travel all the way across the southern part of Illinois without ever touching the ground. And I think that's probably still true. And it's the reality of uh, the forests that I grew up with. So I know about plowing new ground. Um, even when the stumps have been removed, you, when you drive the tractor with the plow over that, or there are all these roots under the ground. And the older the trees were, the bigger the roots. And there's no way really to know where the next root is going to be. They're all underground. So driving a tractor, pulling a plow across new ground is an extremely dangerous and difficult task. If the plow can't cut through a root, the tractor keeps pulling, causing the machine to rise up like an angry horse, and it can't even tip over backwards. Most of us farmers know a few people who've been killed by flipped tractors. Now, tractors are bigger and more powerful nowadays than when I was farming, but in my day, I carried an ax with me when I plowed new ground. Uh, when the plow got stuck, I stopped the tractor and I climbed down and I took that tree, uh, I took that ax and I started chopping out that root. And I kept chopping until I was able to get back on that tractor and pull on through. Now, all this is to say that plowing new ground is a very apt metaphor for navigating our current situation. 
we don't know where the next root is. We don't know how thick it is. Uh, going along full throttle, pedal to the metal, is an extreme risk nowadays. It feels great to hit the gas after you've been stalled for a while and chopping with that ax, but the potential risk is extreme and the consequences are dire. We have been watching that unfold in real time with the school openings uh, uh, that have been happening recently. We are all plowing new ground at the moment. Living memory simply isn't long enough to have gathered lived experience about the place that all of us are living these days. It's not easy, it's disorienting, and it's what we are doing now, all of us. And we kind of need to cut each other some slack about that. So here's some advice from a, an old farmer who has plowed a good bit of new ground in my life and lived through it to tell the tale. I'd say one, be patient. Uh, also accept the challenge and the dangers realistically for the challenges and dangers that they are. Don't just say, ah, oh, pshaw, they're not that dangerous. And chop with an ax as long as you have to, to cut through that reed. Uh, that route. You can't do half measures and get the job done. And remember this, I think dogged patience and persistence, well, those are slow things, but they do get the job done eventually. So um, all that metaphor said, how do we do it? Now, I'm going to read a poem in a little bit, but first off, I want to talk with Anthony Cruz, a friend of FUS, who's also a candidate for UU Ministry. Herbert and David Breeden, thank you so much for extending the invitation and allowing the space for me to share briefly what Congregational Humanism means for me and what I hope for it in the near future. And I guess that if I would need to define congregational humanism, I would talk about three columns that would define it for me in three words. Imagination, community, and justice. As a free thinker, I look to imagination, the human capacity to transcend beyond our current funds of knowledge, that which we hold true for ourselves and the way that we construct particular worldviews to actually expand that knowing into not only a single narrative but to open myself to a global and collective exercise that invite others into the space. And what I mean by that is, what does humanism, free thought, and so on, mean for those that do not share the same social location that I do, that don't hold the same privilege, either economically, culturally, politically, academically, but who are undertaking this journey of self-exploration, of self-discovery, and who are imagining for themselves a space where they can be authentically themselves. As we move then to the second term of community, it speaks then to those dreams, to those imaginations, 
and puts them into praxis, embodies them. And it says, at least for me, I'm moving beyond my individual self. And I am putting myself at the center of the human experience to be in relationship with others. And so when I think about community, then I have to look beyond my immediate experience and my socialization and wonder who is not in this space and whose presence is not here. Whose body, whose voice, whose personality, whose experience are we missing out of? And so being in community talks about accountability of the inner work that I am doing, that I am pursuing, expanding it to the work that we should be doing together, the construction of values, principles, and ethical living, and then calls us forth into justice. Acts of liberation that seek to break away the labels, ideologies, and life stances of oppression within our society. Whose identities, bodies, and lived experiences have been intentionally erased, marginalized, and pushed to the peripheries of our society? And how are we acting as a community, as a collective of people to make sure that others, even those that don't think like us have the same access to equity, equality, and a quality of life that raises up human dignity and human worth. So for me, congregational humanism and my dreams for it speak about the challenge and invitation of unlimited possibilities of engaging our current societies in ways that are authentic, at the same time challenging and difficult because anything that requires human interaction, human relationship, human solidarity requires vulnerability, requires that I myself recognize that I have a lot of work to do, that I should be aware, for example, my male privilege and how sometimes through my acts, through my words, through my actions, I am pushing to the side and marginalizing women, maybe an identity within the LGBTQIA plus. And maybe those that don't think, act, or live like I do. So to sum it up, congregational humanism 
definitely is a bold invitation to engage in dialogue from a global perspective that aims to decolonize one narrative and is an invitation to try to live the human experience, the human search for truth and meaning in unapologetic ways. Thank you. A bit of a poem by the poet Russell Edson, who's considered one of the great practitioners of the prose poem. It's called One Only Afternoon. Since the fern can't go to the sink for a drink of water, I graciously submit myself to the task, bringing two glasses from the sink. And so we sit, the fern and I, sipping water together. I don't mind sipping water with a fern, even though, had I my druthers, I'd be speeding through the air for Stockholm, sipping a Bloody Mary with a wedge of lime. And so we sit one lonely afternoon, sipping water together, the fern looking out of its fronds, and I looking out of mine. I think that kind of summarizes what most of us are feeling during this pandemic time. Uh, yeah, the pandemic and the consequent shutdown of churches and temples and mosques has reignited that debate about the future of congregations in the United States. Now, my crystal ball works only in fits and starts, but I expect both an acceleration and decline of overall church attendance and a decline of those claiming any religious tradition as their own. In other words, my crystal ball predicts that congregations, just like workplaces and schools, will never be the same. First Unitarian society won't ever be the same again either. But how will it be? How do we answer the call of our mission in the world. Well, anthropologists, primatologists, psychologists, biologists, and many other kinds of experts claim that the human religious slash spiritual impulse has a lot to do with our evolutionary advantage and our group solidarity. And congregations waiting to reopen to practice those age-old evolutionary impulses will, I suspect, be very unlikely to reclaim the full tribe again. That's in the past. But if I'm reading the, oh, let's call them tea leaves this time. If I'm reading the tea leaves correctly, the human impulse toward religion slash spirituality will be as active as ever. It'll just be directed in a different direction. It's merely that the old structures aren't going to be the first choice anymore, I suspect. Times have changed. Times have changed due to a wrenching dislocation of our world, and that world will never be the same again. For example, have you seen the research indicating that most Americans are more likely to believe information they receive on social media than from their physician? How are we going to continue navigating in a world in which social media is the arbiter of truth for most people? It's gonna be a strange world as and it kind of already is. The key to finding the future lies in examining, I think, that religious slash spiritual uh, function of human beings and the distinction between them. Traditional congregations have been in the religion and the congregating business for a long time, but you know, they only got into that spiritual business when the market kind of demanded it. Now, my crystal ball says that congregations that will survive and thrive will combine a bricks and mortar congregation with online programming. And eventually, 
we at FUS, I suspect, will have both the bricks and mortar and the online presence almost all the time. Because how many people have called me up and said, you know what, I love assembly in my pajamas. Uh, this is the way to do it. And I think that that number is going to continue to grow. Now, another important aspect will be the firm understanding among congregational leadership concerning what spiritual even means. How are we going to do that? Uh, and, uh, you know, to tip you off to the, my point, no, I don't think there's any difference between the spiritual needs of an atheist and a theist. Um, those are the same kinds of needs, even if you don't call it spiritual. Uh, that is a human psychological aspect that is the same, no matter how you want to define it. A researcher in the evolutionary origins of adaptive human community, Professor John T. Moore, published an article with this title. Are you ready? Multicultural and Idiosyncratic Considerations for Measuring the Relationship Between Religious and Secular Forms of Spirituality with Positive Global Mental Health, end quote. And you know, with a title that long, uh, the guy is actually looking at the facts. And he defines spirituality like this, quote, a personalized, subjective commitment to one's values of connection with self, others, nature, and the transcendent. And I'll repeat that again. A personalized, subjective commitment to one's values of connection with self, others, nature, and the transcendent. He goes on to write, quote, results indicate that living in accordance with one's spiritual values, even when defined in a variety of ways, is characteristic of greater mental health, end quote. Okay, uh, let's break that down a little bit. Yeah, spirituality is personal and it's subjective. The fact is nobody can outsource their spiritual lives. You cannot do it. You can't hand it over to your preacher or your priest or your therapist. We are responsible for our own spiritual lives in a very important way. But notice how the definition turns back on itself. Those personalized, subjective commitments create the values that we hold dear, but those values go way, way beyond the self, out to others, to nature, to the transcendent, however you want to define transcendent. Subjective to objective, and back again, a cycle of nurture from the self all the way out to the universe. And you know, our tradition contains those old folks called the transcendentalists who figured out how to do that a long time ago. We have a tradition that understands the subjective spiritual and the cosmos embracing spiritual. Now, with that definition in mind, Let's think back to the FUS mission. Notice that our promoting a free search for truth, meaning, and justice fits into this contemporary understanding of spirituality just fine. We are here for mutual support, not only in our subjective spiritual health ways, but in our objective support and nurture for ourselves each other, and the cosmos. We are here to join together in a conversation about how to help us all. Conversation about the subjective values that we hold, and also about how we can objectify our values through our work in social justice. As Carl Sagan put it, quote, everything amazing about the universe is inside you. And the two are inseparable, end quote. Universe, you, there's no circle that holds an us and them in that case. 
Now, some of you have seen on social media the picture of uh, Polly Peterson and Rev Jimmon uh, out uh, protesting in the street in front of the downtown post office. You know, that I think objectifies exactly where we're going in the world. You know, Rev Jim and Polly, they didn't talk about theism, atheism, or uh, even the meaning of life. Uh, they both knew there was something that needed to be done, and they got out there in the street and did it. Um, that's the future. That's how we can be a congregation together. Yeah, we can talk about gods and no gods and all of that stuff, but finally, we have to objectify what means most to us in some kind of way that serves the, the greater purpose. That is the future of our congregation, I believe. Um, yeah, you're gonna have a personalized subjective commitment to your values, and you're also going to have a commitment that every citizen deserves to vote, and you're gonna be out there with Polly and Rep. Jim. Well, you know, as the uh, Democratic National Convention uh, has shown us recently, um, we don't have to do things the way they used to be. We can re uh, embrace the new way of doing things. No, we don't have to have someone up on a podium screaming and, and uh, uh, waving his fists around and people jumping up and yelling. Yeah, that's one way to do a convention. It's kind of fun but it's not the only way to do it. We weren't able to do it that way this year. And I think, uh, I think people thought that through a little bit and really discovered some very interesting things. You know, think about the front of a church. Uh, what's up there with that raised platform and that pulpit and uh, oh, singing and, you know, but it's all directed toward the front, isn't it? Uh, and, you know, think about a church from 1650, if you've ever seen one, and from 1750, and from 1850, and 1950, which is when the FUS building was built. Guess what? Um, hmm, you think about it, and they're all, they're all kind of the same, aren't they? But the pandemic gives us an opportunity to reimagine how we do things, how our congregation can do things new and different. Yes, we love our building. We want to be back in our building. That's one way of doing it. But there's also this new social media way, the electronic way of doing it. You know, and it's not an either or. It is a both and. And we at First Unitarian Society accept that challenge to create that new way of sustaining and encouraging the den of conversation. Thank you. Join me from home in our Extinguishing the Chalice words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. All of these we carry in our hearts and in our minds until we are together again. We are the proud inheritors of a long tradition of free thinking, reason, and love. Please help us keep our voice loud and strong in these troubled times by giving to First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis. Thank you.